everyone. It's Susie here with a video I didn't think I would ever create. Just recently my old computer decided that it no longer had the juice to do what I wanted it to and it was time for me to upgrade. When I looked at the PC parts I realized that it was as upgraded as it possibly could be and yeah it was time for a new computer. Now the dilemma I had was that whether or not to purchase a new computer, like a pre-built, or to actually buy the components and build one myself. So I listed out the pros and cons of purchasing a computer versus a pre-built. And the reasons I found to build my own computer would be that I could upgrade it. I would be able to have the experience of having built my own computer. And I could choose the parts that I wanted. The cons for building were that it was going to cost me a lot of money and likely there would be a delay in receiving the parts. Reasons for doing a pre-built is that A, there is no work involved and I can semi-choose the parts that I wanted and the cost would likely be cheaper. But the cons for the pre-built is that I couldn't up can't upgrade too much and the parts I ordered might not be exactly what I asked for and it obviously comes with unwanted accessories. Despite the fact that it's 2021 and the cost of the parts are through the roof, I realized that the end result of buying my own parts and building my computer outweighed the pre-built by a lot in my opinion. So in this video, I'll walk you through my old computer, my new computer, and then I'll walk you through how to build your own computer. Now that the long introduction is over, and I apologize for that, let's go ahead and get to it. So here is my old computer, not lovely to look at. It's a 2016 flagship HP Pavilion 510 series desktop PC tower. It has an Intel Core i7 6700T quad core processor, has a HP 8 gigabyte DDR4 RAM, which I had to upgrade to 16 gigabytes it has a two terabyte hard drive, Intel HD graphics 530, a DVD, Wi-Fi, HDMI, Bluetooth, and came with Windows Home 10. I purchased it in April of 2017 and for the most part, it did what I needed it to do. Here is the inside of the computer. As you can see on the left, I have two sticks of RAM installed. It has a stock cooler, one rear exhaust fan, which you can probably see on the right, with no input fan, and a 180 watt max power supply unit. The hard drive is attached physically to the case, and in this picture I had already removed the hard drive and placed tape over the screws to keep them in place. But as you can see, there's little room for upgrading and the system kept overheating and the fans were running constantly at full bore. So after careful planning and researching, I found that for a hefty cost, I could build my own computer that was upgradable in the future. The main problem I was having was that the pre-built wouldn't let me upgrade the way I wanted and for the cost of them, it didn't, just didn't find it worth it. So I purchased the following parts. When building a computer from scratch, it's much more than just picking the parts. You need to research each part and understand what you're gonna get out of each part. You need to understand how each part works with other parts. I won't go over the intricate details of how I picked each part, but needless to say, it was several weeks of research. After careful research, I had a base list of parts I wanted to get, and then I used PCPartPicker.com to help me make sure that all my parts were compatible. So for you, when building your PC, you're going to need the following. A central processing unit, or a CPU. 
a CPU cooler. If you're not using a stuck cooler, you're going to need some other type of cooler, maybe a watering cooler. You're going to need a motherboard. You're going to need a graphics card, RAM or memory, storage in the form of an M.2 SSD, an HDD, and you're going to need a power supply unit, a case, and of course, your choice of an operating system. So here are the parts that I chose for this build. Like I said, this is an upgradable system and for what I'm using this PC for, the parts provide me with enough power to get the job done. Note that this is not a build for a gaming computer, but it's to be used for programming, YouTubing videos, and computer stuff in general. It will handle games as I do play The Sims and Jurassic World Evolution, but the GPUs that I chose may be too low for what gamers prefer. So for my case, I purchased the Fractal Design Mesh FIC in black. This case was nice to work with and I love the ample amount of breathability compared to my last PCs. Next is the Corsair ML120 Pro, which is a 120 millimeter fan. They are quiet and quite durable. I replaced the old fans and put in these fans, two in the front and one in the rear. For my motherboard, I chose the ASOS AM4 Tough Gaming X570 Plus with Wi-Fi ATX motherboard. I chose this because my research stated that I could upgrade my processor to a Ryzen 7 later and the board will handle it just fine. For the processor, I chose the AMD Ryzen 5 3600 6-core 3.6 GHz. Again, I'm only running two games and mostly the computer will be used for programming and YouTube videos, so I don't need all that much power. Although, maybe later I might decide to upgrade to the Ryzen 7. Instead of using the stock cooler that comes with the Ryzen 5, I chose the Mugen 5 Rev. This is a slight beast, but it will allow my CPU to perform nicely for what I need it to do. I had planned on going with the stock cooler, but after research and some advice, I was guided to the Mugen. I have no regrets. I also purchased the Arctic Cooling Inc. MX-4 4-gram thermal compound instead of using the stock compound that came with the CPU. My last computer was only upgradable to 16 gigabytes in memory and it wasn't enough for my system. With all the programs I was running, I was maxing out my RAM. How honestly, when someone tells you eight gigabytes of RAM is enough, don't believe them. Today's programs take so much memory that even 16 gigabytes is hardly enough anymore. This time I wanted to make sure that I had ample RAM to run all my programs. The G-Skills Trident Z Neo DDR4-3600 does not disappoint. So for storage, I went with the Samsung 980 Pro M.2, a 250GB stick and a 1TB stick. The initial plan was to put the operating system on the 250GB stick and everything else on the 1TB stick. My plan not, might be working so well as I'm already at 126 gigabytes of the 250 gigabytes. That's roughly half the stick storage space. I might just need to replace the 250 stick with a one terabyte and keep the 250 as a backup. For power, I chose to go higher if I decide to upgrade in the future. Here I purchased the Corsair RM750 SLI Ready Crossfire 80 Plus Gold Certified Full Modular Power Supply. Yeah, that's a handful. This might be overkill, but with the PC perk picker, I was already up to 550 watts, so the Corsair 750 may just have the power that I need if I decide to upgrade in the future. Finally, I got the Asus GE Force RTX 2060 overclocked 6G for the gaming card. 
This was slightly overpriced, but it was the only card available at the time that wasn't $1,000 or more. It has two HDMI ports, which is great for my dual monitor system. My games play well on it and I'm happy. I may upgrade to the RTX 3070 later, but that remains to be seen. Additionally, I got the Beige StarTech Anti-Static Mat and the iFixit Pro Tech Toolkit. The mat was great and I hardly used the iFixit Toolkit. I found myself instead working with the large Phillips head screwdriver that came with my Mugen cooler. But the iFixit Toolkit is a great kit with lots of different heads, an extension wand, and a magnetic page, anti-static wristband, and an assortment of tools. I did find myself using the anti-static pad under the toolkit for placement of my screws instead of the glass dish I had originally planned on using. And so once assembled, this is what the PC looks like. I'm not a great cable manager, but it works from the case was able to close without issue. I replaced the two fans in the case with the Corsair fans and added an extra fan in the front. The PC runs quietly and the only RGB lighting is from the RAM and the small stripe on the GPU. Now to building your PC. I will walk you through the steps and I believe will make your experience better as a builder. So for step one, I want you to go ahead and inspect and take pictures of everything. Before installing, take pictures of the boxes, the products, the serial numbers. Make sure that none of your parts are damaged. Step two, create a work environment to which you will build your PC. A wood table is ideal. Do not build your PC on carpet or metal. I suggest grounding yourself either with an anti-static mat or a wristband or even both. I did with both. If you must have a fan blowing on the area to keep you cool, just make sure it's not blowing directly on your workstation. Fans blow all kinds of debris, hair, dust, fur, and you want to try and keep your workstation as clean and breeze-free as possible. Organize your setup. Set out the boxes in easy-to-reach places that won't affect your build. Make sure you aren't reaching over something that could potentially be knocked over onto the floor. Make sure you have the proper tools with you. Nothing is more frustrating than getting partway through your build and realizing you don't have the correct tools. Step three, speaking of tools, you will need a screwdriver kit with a Phillips or a flathead screwdriver. I recommend multiple sizes from large to small. A small bowl to keep your screws or a magnetic bowl. Anti-static mat wristband to ground yourself. Tweezers to grab a screw if it falls in a tight place where your fingers won't reach. A flashlight for hard to see areas, especially when you're working inside the case as it will cast shadows. Assembling your PC can be done in a variety of ways. This is the way I did my build. First work on the motherboard, plugging in as much as you can before inserting it into the case. Once in the case, room will become very limited. I suggest hooking up your cables to the motherboard before screwing it into the case. Once the motherboard has the necessary components on it, such as the CPU, the RAM, the cooler, the M.2 storage, and the cables, then install it in the case. Make sure your cables are in the proper slots and grooves for maximum cable management. You'll have to experiment a bit with the cables to see the best way they flow. Next, install the power supply unit, your SSD and HDDs, or your solid state drives and your hard disk drives. And lastly, your graphics card. Once the build is complete, before cable management, you'll test the system. If all is good, then you'll go ahead and perform your cable management and install your OS, or operating system. Now that we know in what order to build, let's talk a little bit more about the build. Please understand that each build is different and not all instructional steps will be identical. 
so refer to your owner's manual for further assistance. You can also check with Google and other YouTube videos for additional help. At this stage, make sure that you are grounded. Grounding yourself will reduce the amount of electrical charge buildup on your person that will be transferred to your components. If you're using an anti-static mat or wristband, connect the metal prong to a piece of metal like your computer case. The static will discharge from you to the metal. If you wear an anti-static wristband, I suggest you wear it on your non-dominant hand. I've heard the suggestion of placing the wristband on your ankle and then grounding it to a piece of metal, such as your PSU, your power supply unit. As long as your skin is in contact with the band and the prong is attached to some metal that is not plugged in, you will be grounded. The motherboard is the main hub. It is what allows all of your parts to talk to each other and operate. So let's take out the motherboard and place it on the anti-static bag or on the box itself. Inspect it. Make sure you have all the ports and plugs you need. Identify and locate the ports and plugs at this stage. Read your owner's manual as it will guide you to what the ports and plugs are. Once the board is in the case, you will have limited room and lighting, so be aware of the ports that may be set in a tight corner. CPU socket. Locate the small triangle. You will need to line this up with your CPU for installation. You do not want to handle the CPU for too long. So the quicker you get this into place, the better. Once you've located the triangle, flip the metal bar up. This will open up the CPU pinholes. Not every CPU base will be the same. Depending on the manufacturer of your motherboard, your base may look different. Remove the CPU from the box, carefully handling it by the sides only. Do not touch the top or the bottom of the CPU. Touching the bottom can damage the pins and the oils from your hands can cause damage over time. Look for the small arrow at the corner of the CPU and line it up with the arrow on the motherboard CPU socket. With the arrows lined up, gently place the CPU into place. There is no need to push the CPU down. It should fall into place. Do not rub the CPU back and forth. You will damage the pins. If the CPU doesn't go in, lift it up, check to make sure that you have the arrows aligned correctly, and try again. Once the CPU does fall into place, you may give it a gentle jiggle to make sure it is seated properly. Do this with caution. You do not want to damage the CPU. You may now push the metal bar down to lock the CPU into place. Now unbox your RAM. Do not touch the contacts. The oils from your skin can damage them. Handle it by the board itself or the casing. Your motherboard will indicate which slots to occupy first and which slots are secondary. If you are not sure, then the proper configuration is the closest slot to the CPU is slot number one and the furthest is slot number four. You'll want to occupy slots two and four first. If you are doing dual RAM in a four slot configuration. If you are doing a two slot configuration, occupy the slot furthest from the CPU. Press the right side of the RAM slot tab to the open position. The most common RAM today is DDR4, which has a notch just over halfway on the board. Line up this notch in the slot on the motherboard. It will only go in one way. Next, with the RAM lined up, insert the card into the slot. Sometimes it's easiest to install the longer side slightly down first, then the shorter side. 
Press down somewhat firmly until you hear a snap. The snap will indicate that the ram is locked into place. Do not force the ram. You will damage it. If it doesn't go, check your alignment and try again. Moving on, now is a good time to install your CPU cooler. I won't go into great detail here as everyone has a different CPU cooler. If you are using a water cooling system, I suggest you watch Jay's Two Cents Water Cooling 101 for Beginners. It's a great tutorial. If you are installing a stock cooler or any other cooler, please refer to their installation guide. To install a cooler, you'll need thermal paste. Less is more when using this stuff. Lightly coat the top of the CPU with the paste. Do not use your hand to do this. Most stock coolers come with paste and a plastic spreader. You can also use a guitar pick if you have one. Again, less is more. Do not gob the paste on the CPU. A nice thin layer is all you need. Do not get the paste on any part of the CPU component or any other components, period. If you do, simply take 99% isopropyl alcohol and a tissue to remove it. Do not use anything else. Once the paste is spread, remove the plastic backing on the cooler. Apply the cooler to the CPU according to the guide instructions and secure it into place. Make sure that the bulk end of your cooler, if not using the stock cooler, is away from your RAM. Do not place the cooler up against your RAM. Once securely in place, neatly wrap the cooler or the fan cord and plug it in to one of the slots, preferably the one closest to the CPU marked CPU fan. Next, install any M.2 storage devices you have. If your motherboard comes with this expansion slot, it might have a cover plate. If it does, remove the plate. Screw in the standoffs at the correct length of your M.2 card. There should be several screw holes for this. Choose the correct length. Again, do not touch the contact, only the board, and insert the card into the slot. Line up the notch on the card with the notch in the slot housing, for it only goes in one way. Proper installation will have the words on the card facing up. The slot is at the top of the slot housing. Once the card is in place, gently press the card down to the standoff screw and screw it into place. Do not over tighten the screw. You will damage the card. If a plate was part of the housing, remove the backing on the plate, which is your heat sink, line up the holes and screw it back into place. Now that most of your motherboard is assembled, you'll want to work on your case. Remove the two side panels and the rear power supply mount bracket if you have one. Locate your cables and identify them. Move your hard disk drive plate away from your power supply cage to make room for the power cords. Now install your I.O. plate shield. It should snap into place. Remove any fans and replace them as necessary or just add the necessary fans. Moving on, the installation of your fans is easy. You'll need to know which direction the fans move air, what configuration you want for airflow, and where the fan plugs are on your motherboard. The best analogy is that faces suck. That means that the face of the fan will draw air into the fan and the rear of the fan will expel it. Many fans come with a directional arrow on them in case you are unsure. Another way to tell the front from the back is that the rear of the fan will have wires coming from it and there is a support lattice on the back. You can always mark your fans front and back if you can't remember. Airflow in the computer should always be front to back or bottom to top. 
When installing your fans, make sure you install them according to the correct airflow direction. Front and bottom fans should face out, while back and top fans should face in. You'll want to make sure you have enough fan connectors on your motherboard to support the amount of fans you are installing in your PC. Air pressure is key to understanding airflow. Remember that airflow direction in a computer is front to back and bottom to top. There are three kinds of air pressure, positive, negative, and equal. Positive air pressure is when you have more air coming into the system than you have going out of the system. While this configuration doesn't always keep the case the coolest, it negative air pressure is when you have more air going out of the system than you have going in. This configuration will keep your case cooler, but it creates a vacuum which will draw air in from other areas, and your fans will have to work harder to expel it. Finally, we have equal pressure. This is when you have the same amount of air going into the system as you do going out. Here are some ways that you can have fan configurations in your computer. Feel free to pause the video to see the different configurations. As with all cases, refer to your case manual to see what configurations it will allow. Next, you'll need to decide which air pressure configuration is best for you. Most people choose to have a positive air pressure. In the following illustrations, the blue arrows represent the inflow air and the purple arrows represent the outflow air. Here you see different ways to create positive pressure in your system. If you have two front fans, you'll need one rear fan. If you have two bottom fans, you'll need one top fan. My system is two front fans and one rear fan. Remember, in the positive air pressure system, you must have more inflow fans than outflow fans. Next is the negative air pressure configuration. Here you see different ways to create negative pressure in your system. Remember, in the negative air pressure system, you must have more outflow fans than you have inflow fans. Finally, is the equal air pressure configuration. Here you see different ways to create equal pressure in your system. Remember that in an equal air pressure system, you must have the same number of outflow fans that you have inflow fans. Now that your fans are installed, you can install your motherboard. However, lesson learned on this, once the motherboard is installed, space and lighting become very limited. If you can and have the ability to connect any power cables prior to installing the motherboard. I personally have big hands and had difficulty installing two power cables once the motherboard was installed, and I needed my partner who had smaller hands to do the installation of the power cables to the motherboard. Cables you'll be needing to connect prior to motherboard installation are the front I.O. connectors, the audio or AAFP connector, USB cable connectors, and ATX power connectors. However, also make sure that you have room to install the cables to your power supply as well if you are connecting the cables first to your motherboard. You can either install the plugs prior to putting the motherboard in the case or gently place the motherboard in the case without securing it and then install the cables. Before placing your motherboard in the case, you will need to install any standoffs if they are required. Check with your case manual and motherboard manual. Install the standoffs, usually nine of them. Then place the motherboard gently into the case. If you're installing the cables before fixing the motherboard to the case, place the motherboard gently in the case. Depending on the size of your motherboard, 
There may not be a lot of wiggle room and you may need to install some of the cables just outside of the case. Connect the cables and make sure that they are out of the way of the motherboard. Then lift and place the motherboard so that the motherboard I.O. panel slides into the I.O. plate. Make sure your I.O.s align properly. If alignment is good, then screw the motherboard down. Do not over tighten. You can damage the board. Let's go over some of the power cables you'll need to install. The first is the front I.O. connectors. Refer to your motherboard manual for connection instructions, but you'll need to install them accordingly. Lesson learned, do the back ones, then the front ones. If your board is already installed, you'll want to insert the HDD LED and the reset first, since they are on the outside of the board, then install the power LED and the power SW and speaker last. If you haven't installed the motherboard, it doesn't matter which you install first as long as you install them in the correct slots. Key word of advice, the writing on the plugs face the outside edge of the board. Once these are connected, you can go ahead and attach the audio plug. Find the plug marked AAFP or JAUD1. You'll want to consult your motherboard map to see how this is marked. Line up the pins accordingly and press the plug down. The words should face the inside of the board. Make sure that the connection is properly seated. Next, plug in the USB cables. Find the plugs marked USB 3 or USB 2. Match up the plugs and press firmly into place. Again, make sure that the plug is properly seated. Consult your motherboard manual to see how this plug may be marked. Next, plug in your ATX power cables. This is the largest cable with 24 pins. Match up the plug, making sure that the clip is on the right side and press firmly into place. The clip must go over the lip. Again, make sure the plug is properly seated. Next, install the EPS cables. Plug the end marked CPU into the 8-pin socket on your board, usually the top left. Line up the clip accordingly and make sure that the cable is properly seated. If your board has an extra 4-pin connector, you can split the 8-pin and plug it in here too. If your board has two 8-pin connectors and your power supply comes with an extra EPS cable, plug this in too. Now you can plug in your fans. Remember that the fan to your CPU will plug into the slot CPU fan while the other fans will be marked differently, likely as CHA fan for chassis fan. Once these cables are connected, go ahead, if you haven't already, secure your motherboard to the case. Again, remember, do not over tighten the screws as you can damage the board. Once the board is secure, we can move on to the power supply unit. Your power supply unit should have a number of cables that came with it. You have already installed a few. Now let's connect those and any other additional cables to the power supply unit. Place the power supply unit in the slot with the fan facing down if you have a grilled bottom. If your case doesn't have a grilled bottom, then place the power supply unit with the fan facing up. Now attach the cables. Attach the 24 pin connector in the slot marked ATX. The connector for this cable will have type four on the side. Attach the CPU cable to the section marked PCI-E CPU. 
the CPU labeled side goes into the motherboard, which we did a couple steps ago. Attach the 8-pin power cable to the PCIe slot. The other end will attach to your graphics card. Next, attach the SATA cables to the area marked peripherals and SATA. The other end will attach to your hard disk drive or your solid state drive. Attach the Molex cable to the PSU or the power supply unit marked under peripherals and SATA. Now let's install your graphics card. Remove two card slot panels from the rear of your computer. Line it up with your graphics card slot on the motherboard. Remove the protective casing from the connectors. Again, do not touch the gold connectors. Oils can damage the card. Hold the graphics card from the bottom. The card goes in only one way. Slide the card into the motherboard PCIe slot. It should snap into place. You will need a flat head to remove the graphics card by pushing on the locking tab. If you don't do this, you will damage your card. Adjust the card gently and screw it into place using the locking screws. Look at your card and see what PCIe ports it has. I have a NVIDIA RTX 2060 and it has an 8-pin port. Your PCIe cable will be used for your graphics card. To know how many you'll need, you'll need to look at your GPU. Some cards are 8-pin and some are 16. Attach the appropriate PCIe cable. Make sure that the clip is properly aligned and snaps over the lip. This will indicate that the plug is firmly seated. Install any other cards such as a sound card, a capture card, or an SSD card at this time. Now let's install the hard disk drive, the HDD. You'll need to insert the hard drive into the hard drive tray provided by your case. Remove a tray and either place the hard drive on the tray and secure it using four screws to the bottom or locate the insertion pins on the side of the tray and insert the hard drive into the tray, lining up the insertion pins to the four holes on the side of the hard drive. Make sure that your hard drive cable connectors are facing the front where the tray tabs are located. Connect your SATA cables to the drive. For the 3.5 inch drive, you'll need a SATA data cable and a SATA power cable. The other end of the SATA cable will connect to your motherboard and the larger SATA power cable will connect to your power supply. Once the cables are connected, slide the tray back in. Some hard drives are physically attached to the case and need screws to install them. In this case, connect your cables to the hard drive, line up the holes on the back side of the drive, and screw the hard drive into place. Now attach your solid disk drive or SSD drive. Many new cases today will have SSD mounts on the side of the case. Older cases may have a tray just like the HDD. If the SSD is similar to the hard drive, follow the instructions of the hard drive for the SSD. If the case is newer and the SSD location is on the side of the case, remove the SSD tray screw in the SSD card, connect their cables, and then screw the tray back into place. Everything should be plugged in. Check once more to make sure that your cables are properly seated. If your case came with a power supply faceplate, replace that now. Connect a monitor, keyboard, and mouse. Plug in the power cord to the power supply unit or PSU and the other end into the wall outlet and power up the power supply. If the PSU is running, hit the power switch on the computer. You should see a boot up screen and a message. If you see this message, all is good. Go ahead and power down your machine, turn it off, 
and unplug it from the wall and begin your cable management. For cable management, use zip ties, twisty ties, or Velcro ties. Make sure your cables are snug but not taut. You don't want too much pressure on the cable ends. Tuck any loose cabling into crevices and try to make the arrangement as flat as possible. You still need to get the side of the case back on. Use the loop holes in the case to help you manage your cables. Once you are satisfied, go ahead and put both side panels back on. Yep, that's it. You're done. At this stage, you can install any operating system you want, update your drivers, or overclock your system as you deem fit. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up button and consider subscribing to my channel. Hit the bell icon too so you'll never miss another video. I'll see you in the next video.